phenomenon recognized as brain drain. Brain drain. Brain drain. Brain drain. Brain drain. So I, I would not call it a brain drain. It's a brain, hmm, brain gain. What is an invention that is inherently human? The bridge. The bridge is a solution, a connection, a feat of engineering. It allows us to move forwards, across, beyond. It is the symbol of expansion and development, and the icon of stability. Bridges are not constructed with steel and cable alone. Today, bridges are built with people. Minds, ideas, bodies in transit connecting the world. Many have decided that this flux of migration, be it for work or education, is detrimental for the country losing out on brain power. We're here to tell a different story. A story of connectivity, of relationships, of mutual beneficiality. A story of brain bridges. So, I'm going to start with a story of my own. So it was uh, in 1983 when I boarded a flight. It was the first time in my uh, life to uh, take a flight. Uh, I came to the U.S. in 95. So that's my first time to take an airplane. So back in 1997, uh, I had to decide to, uh, to come to the U.S. And at the time, I had no doubt in my mind that I would come back to Korea to teach or work. But 33 years later, I'm still stuck at Stanford. <laughs> you know, this raises an interesting question, because am I a case of brain drain? So from conventional perspective, the answer would be yes, because Korea lost at least one brain power. But from different perspective, I may not be such a case of brain drain, and I'll explain you know, why. So when you think of uh, global talent, or talk about global talent, uh, you know, we tend to focus on human capital aspect, just like uh, skills, education, knowledge, and experience. The social capital is as important as human capital. Any global talent must possess not only skills and knowledge, but also social networks and social capital. When somebody has ties in more than one place, then you can you know, bridge or connect between two different places, right? You know, we can connect uh, different cultures. Uh, we can facilitate cross-national collaboration that is very essential for today's international business transaction. Okay, this is what I call brain linkage. In 2018, the U.S. became home to 91 $1 billion startups. 55% of those startups were founded by immigrant entrepreneurs. The United States is an immigrant country, but it hasn't always acted like one. Let me tell you a story. So in 1967, when I come here, yeah, I think I'm smart. I'm from IIT. I'm doing very, very well as a person. So this professor gave us a short term quiz, you know, a month into, into the war. He gave us a short term quiz and I aced it. So he tells me after the, the class, he says, you know, I want to remind you that we don't cheat in America. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> he says, nobody was supposed to ace that quiz. Yeah, we haven't told the material yet. Well, he thought you cheated. <laughs> you know, therefore you cheated. I said, no, no, this stuff, I, you know, we told this last year at, 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 you know, at IID. You know, there was nothing new, new here for me. Mm -hmm. So next time, a month later, he did the short term quiz and he stood behind me for a whole hour. And I asked it again. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you're cheating, you're very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, that was the image of India. Oh, that was the image of India in the 60s. Wow. Yeah, we were not seen as smart people. Yeah. Kanwal Reiki moved to the US from India before founding Silicon Valley-based company Exelan in 1982. Reiki is credited as the first Indian-American entrepreneur to take a company public on NASDAQ. 
Following his entrepreneurial success, Reiki became an advocate for border-breaching entrepreneurs and pushed Indian legislators to reform venture regulations, an action seen by many as being unpatriotic. Yeah. I spent a huge amount of money. I spent a huge amount of time. I put myself at risk, right? You know, because half the people hated me. There were people who would come and say, how dare you tell us? You know, you, you know, you know. My brother told me that I was a traitor to India. I left India. I have no business telling you know, them what to do. But Reiki's reforms created a whole new generation of Indian entrepreneurs and had a tangible impact on the entire country's economy. Facebook is one of several Silicon Valley companies rolling out the red carpet for Prime Minister Modi. Some say he's being treated like a rock star. After all, an Indian head of state hasn't visited California in 33 years. Here on the stage, you see a perfect picture of India-US partnership in digital economy. If there was ever a gathering under one roof that could claim to be shaping the world, it is this. India is the second or third largest uh, number of entrepreneurs in the world now, right? I used to worry about yeah, India being left behind, but I don't worry about that anymore. Yeah, I don't see it stuck in the mud. I see a growth. I see yeah, yeah, messiness. I see you know, <laughs> indiscipline, but I also see the market functioning. Reiki is a product of IITB, the India Institute of Technology, a powerful and highly regarded institution that he has contributed much back to in return for the foundation they gave him. International powerhouses of academia are breeding grounds for global success, forging brain linkages across the entire planet. Eugene Zhang graduated from Tsinghua University in China before starting a club of angel investors in Silicon Valley, formed from Tsinghua alumni. And we, we started uh, all schoolmates, Tsinghua alumni, you know, has a, quite a bigger population here, actually. Uh, by now it's over... 15,000. So, so that we were this Qinghua group, uh, you know, you know, we said, hey, maybe we should, uh, especially this uh, called a Tik Tik uh, Qinghua Entrepreneur uh, kind of club, $4 million to start to, to, uh, to invest, yeah, to form this fund. So, so from our numbers, we saw in the last nine, uh, close to nine years, we seeded uh, 150 companies. Uh -huh. So from numbers, we have uh, about 40% um, uh, with Chinese um, founders, like a 10 to 15% there are the returnees that go back to China to take advantage of the, whatever the uh, local, local market. But uh, it's our key uh, differentiator. Although the percentage, we wish to get, reach like 50% Chinese founders, but uh, I think our differentiator is to help the the Chinese uh, uh, community, the immigrant community in the, in the valley, they may not be able to get uh, the mainstream uh, investors early on, like a Zoom CEO, for example. So they are not the favorite on saying here. You say, oh, you are, your English isn't less perfect, and I, for you to be a CEO and sell to US big corporation, I'm not sure uh, you are that person, right? So, but uh, we, will, we will be that uh, early seed. Uh, I came to the U.S. in 95, in the summer of 95, actually, I came to Stanford as a PhD student. I think the wage level in the mid-90s is about, I think for my parents, it's about maybe uh, $20 a month, something like that. You can imagine, right? So no one can afford to go to the U.S. to study, actually. The most PhD students at Stanford have scholarship. So of course I got scholarship from Stanford. Uh, I got paid to come here. Uh, so luckily, <laughs> although we were really poor, we could come here to study. Uh, but in the early 2000s, there's not much opportunity in China. Not many opportunities in China. So in mainland China. So I first went went back to Hong Kong in 2001. I had offers in the U.S., but I decided to uh, go back uh, to Hong Kong. So my first job was in Hong Kong. Hongbin Li is an example of what we call reverse circulation. 
Having taken advantage of his American education, Li returned to his native China to utilize his PhD and simultaneously work and conduct research on the Chinese economy before returning to Stanford as a professor. This phenomenon of reverse circulation can also be found in immigrants who look to their home country for employees, creating jobs and further opportunities for brain linkages. I did three companies here, and all of the company I did, I had a uh, I had engineering back in, in India, in Bangalore. Wow. September, October, November, December, my tickets are booked, so I'm going back every month. Wow. To India, that's long. It's a long, long journey. It's a long journey. Wow. And it's, uh, it's tough, but, uh, but I want to try and get this commission done because uh, I feel that, uh, uh, that uh, you, know, you know, we have so much talent in, our, in, the, in the country. Professor Paul Rush champions reverse circulation because it gives him the opportunity to draw from the technical experience of his Indian countrymen while continuing to operate in an American market. Current Stanford student Sivlin Lin tells a different story. She plans to bring her American education back home with her, with a dream of bettering her country as a whole. Um, and my goal is to study in the US, work here a couple of years after my, um, after my master, and then, you know, go back to Cambodia and hopefully bring a new perspective from the U.S. to, like, help develop Cambodia in a positive way that I can. Yeah, the, uh, Cambodia is a very small country and not, um, you know, not many people are aware of what is happening in Cambodia. So just as one of the around 400 students in the U.S., I want to... I want to be the bridge that would help uh, Cambodia to be known in other parts of other parts of the world, so that um, people can start to care about what is happening in Cambodia. There is such a beautiful pride in one's connection to their home, a relationship that cannot be tarnished by distance alone. Whenever I um, land myself uh, in Narita. Um, I feel this sense of connection, and that's like, I can't take that out from my psyche. I just feel like, ah, I'm here, you know? And that's my home country. Um, and that's gonna be there for forever with me. That's so much a part of myself. Um, but here in the States, so, you know, I feel like, um, I, f I feel like I'm sort of in a limbo, I I'm not, um, just in Japan or I'm not just in the States I'm somewhere in between and um, and that maybe being here let me be that way maybe yeah since I was going back and forth quite quite a bit to India I also saw some young entrepreneurs there who were thoroughly underserved like the ecosystem was very weak so the first few times I um, just gave them cheap tickets to come to Palo Alto and we had an extra home that we had kept, our older home we had kept and we had moved to Atherton. So the Palo Alto home which is in downtown, I said why don't you guys come here, the first batch was like I think six or seven people, so why don't you guys come and stay here for a few weeks, let's see what, you know, come and meet some angels, some VCs. So then it slowly became, became the India house, so now there is big throngs of people that come and they use this house for, it's like an informal India incubator. Ideally, I feel it, I wish Indian government had set it up, but this has become like an Indian incubator now. So for my wife and I, we just made circles. <laughs> so we first went to Beijing for college and then came to Stanford and then went to Hong Kong for work and then returned to Beijing to work and now back to <laughs> Palo Alto again. <laughs> so, we have done it two rounds, I think. I don't know if we're going to move again, so... <laughs> Li was instrumental to organizing the Stanford-China Economic Summit in Beijing in September 2018. Bridges are vital in empowering their local native populations, creating a sense of community and shared purpose. Compared to other ethnic groups, Korea is a really closed group, in my view. So we set up the, we started in the Bay Area uh, K group. So the first was uh, sharing the knowledge, uh, let's build up the more 
uh, look at the beyond of what you are doing, prepare for the next trend, and then also sharing the uh, job opportunity. Uh, and then the, later on, we start to helping the Korean uh, people who are coming to the Silicon Valley to help them to settle down, or the, a group of people who are visiting the Silicon Valley, how are we going to uh, give a message to wake up call uh, kind of thing. So, so those things, uh, Bay Area K Group, uh, we're greatly expanding and very active. Not all linkages are products of a physical relocation. America is home to millions of second and third generation immigrants who can simultaneously draw from their ancestral culture and American grounding. My father is from Singapore and my mother is from Taiwan, but I myself was born and raised in rural New Jersey. I spent one year doing research in a lab at Harvard and one, uh, a year and a half in a lab at Singapore. And then I went to um, uh, Stanford for my PhD when I, and I continued collaborating with a lab in Singapore since then. So um, I was not culturally too connected to Singapore because where I grew up in rural New Jersey, I must have been one of the only Asian, um, one of the only, only Asians in my town growing up. And the word on the street was that embryonic stem cells was a major area of investment for the Singapore government. I thought maybe to do an internship in Singapore, and they have a program through the ASTAR, or the Agency for Science, Technology, and Research, that allows people like myself um, to actually do um, several month internships there. Mm -hmm. I didn't really. I guess even now I don't really think of myself as kind of having, um, being from Singapore in a sense. I really went there only because of the research and because it was a chance to maybe get to know my extended family a bit better, but my main goal was it, it did good research and that's all I cared about. You know, this U.S. is you know, like an engine of vitality in science. They really want to be connected and collaborate with, and have joint grants with the U.S. So I guess they were actually looking for a bridge. One of the most exciting things was that many people from the lab were actually um, from overseas or were Singaporeans who had trained overseas. So I always thought it was really cool because people had different cultural and scientific backgrounds and were all working under one roof. For many, the humming engine of American entrepreneurship is an irresistible call. Gen Isiyama quickly learned the value of his unique position between two continents and spearheaded a generation of Japanese-US business relations. And, and you know, when I left, you know, nine, 18 years ago, I was just trying to learn this, what it means to be an entrepreneur and trying to transplant that, you know, spirit into a country where the innovation is, is not there yet. Uh, at that time, you know, information technology seemed to be the next big thing. Uh, for any country, uh, and, and obviously Silicon Valley at that time was leading in the world, so I, I wanted to at least learn that when I came here. But they asked me, uh, again, can you help some of our U.S. companies enter Japanese market? Because some companies are ready to go, and we need someone to get there, because there's a language barrier, a business barrier, and unless you're native, it's very hard to go to Japan. Um, but someone has to connect them, right? So I became a perfect bridge, uh, a perfect conduit or, or a middleman for Japanese entrepreneurship world while I was doing this business there for U.S. company entering Japan. Uh, when, when Prime Minister Abe came here yes. a couple years ago at yes. Stanford, um, he very much emphasized the role of reach yes. between South and Valley, yes. and then he probably had you in mind yeah. at this figure. Yeah, so, I, so you know, before, uh, there was a debate whether he should be coming here or not after going to Washington, D.C. And I was asked, obviously asked by the government, if he were to come here, what, what should he be saying at Stanford? I want the best and the brightest Japanese talent with superb technology and high motivation to dive themselves into Silicon Valley. We have too many middle-sized companies and SMEs which cannot break out of local markets despite having world-class technological capacity that we can boast to the world. Out of such companies, we will select 200 companies in the next five years to send to Silicon Valley. Connecting the people on both sides, that, that's, that's the agenda we're trying to do. Yeah, but for those who say it's a brain drain, I feel like, no, you know, um, there's a new energy through those people who decided to go abroad. 
I believe we can dismantle the idea of brain drain, and everyone should believe that they can positively impact their country and pursue their own mission wherever they are. So I think you know one thing clear uh, is that there will be more mobility uh, among talents uh, in the world, and you know some people will continue to leave their home country for education or. Uh, employment and people may say that uh, it can be brain drain uh, for home country and brain gain uh, for host country but in our view it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game it could be you know win-win for both home and host countries you know all the people uh, in this documentary you know, they are doing some kind of uh, bridging between their home country and the United States. And they are playing a crucial role to enhancing you know, mutual understanding uh, between their country of origin uh, and the United States. And I think that's something we should continue to encourage uh, in the future. However, uh, we know that uh, uh, transnational uh, breaching uh, can be challenging uh, as well, especially uh, in the politically uh, difficult situation uh, with the rise of anti-immigrant uh, sentiment, uh, rise of uh, anti-foreign sentiment uh, in some countries. Especially when there is a political tension uh, between uh, your home country and uh, your country of residence, just like uh, maybe US-China tension, uh, there can be some uh, risk uh, in breaching uh, between the two countries. So we are aware of that uh, challenge, but I think that's why uh, it's becoming more and more important to have more uh, transnational breaching because that will enhance uh, understanding uh, or you know, better appreciation of uh, both cultures and, and societies.